أغمض عينيك وتذكر تسبيحا حلوا أحبهما إلى الناس That, O oh Allah, make people love your servant Abu Huraira and his mother. <coughs> if you look at the beginning of the hadith, that Abu Huraira said, there is no one, be a Jew or Christian, who would not hear about me except that he would love me. And this is based upon what the, what the Prophet ﷺ said about Abu Huraira, O oh Allah, make people love your servant Abu Huraira and his mother. So people who love Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu that we are part of the answering of that supplication that the Prophet sallallahu made for him and those who have hatred for him ayyadhan billah we know their position their position is clear that they, they are not from those whom the Prophet sallallahu made dua for if you love Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You come under the du'a of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And let it be known that Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu is from the companions who narrated more ahadith than any other companion, more than any other companion. And both the Rafidah and the Orientalists tried to attack Abu Huraira, his integrity and his position, in an amazing way. In a very awful way, in a filthy way, the things that they say about Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So the fact is that we defend the honor of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose him to be the one who narrated more ahadith than any other companion. That is an honor. That is an honor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to him over other companions. So it shows the importance of calling one's parents if they are to be they're non-Muslims, to call them to, to Islam, to call them to Islam and to be patient, to show patience towards one parent, one's parents. If at the first time they say no, the second time they say no, the third time they say no, they continue to say no, maybe years and years and years and years they pass. But you are persistent. And when you call them to Islam, you do it in many different ways. It is not necessarily that you sit there in front of them and say, listen, become Muslim. Save yourself from the hellfire. Maybe that's not from wisdom to say it in that manner. But you can call them to Islam, maybe via your words, by whatever means or whatever wording you want, or through your actions, to show good behavior towards them, to buy gifts. Okay, it's not bribery. You're supposed to be good to your parents, and showing, you know, showing goodness to your parents means buying them gifts. This will, and this will, you can teach them that this is from Islam. Tahadu, tahabu, that by giving gifts that increases love between one another. Okay, don't be stingy. Don't not buy anything uh, for your parents because you know you say, well, you know, we only celebrate two celebrations in the year. That's Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. You get two gifts from me a year. And don't be like that. Okay? <coughs> it doesn't have to be those celebrations. They can be, you know, at any time in the year that you buy gifts uh, for your parents. Uh, no, the next chapter is chapter number 19, is hadith number 35. And this dutifulness towards parents after their death. <coughs> dutifulness towards parents after their death. So just as we are required to be dutiful and respectful and good to our parents while they are alive, it certainly does not stop if they pass away or when they pass away. We will all pass away. Every single soul shall taste death. So just as you are respectful and honored your parents while they were alive, likewise there are many things that you can do if they pass away. The hadith or the number of narrations that are mentioned here, the first one is narrated by Abu Sayyid Malik ibn Rabi'ah. Well, he said, we were with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when a man asked, O oh, Messenger of Allah, is there any act of dutifulness which I can do for my parents after their death? <coughs> the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam answered, Naam, yes. There are four ways 
making supplication for them, asking forgiveness for them, fulfilling their pledges, being respectful to their friends and maintaining such ties of kinship which you have inherited through them. So here the Prophet, uh, it is mentioned that the Prophet mentioned four khisal, four ways that we can show dutifulness to our parents once they, once they passed away, once they pass away. So the first one that is mentioned is الدُّعَاءُ To make supplication for them To ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant them the Jannah To protect them from the hellfire To widen their grave, to give them nur in their grave To give them blessings in their grave To protect them from the punishment of the grave Okay, this is dua aam. This is general Make dua in a general sense in all matters for them Secondly, وَالْإِسْتِغْفَارُ لَهُمَا and istighfar is to seek forgiveness, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive them. Is this not type of a dua? It is, yes. It is a type of dua. But the fact that it is mentioned here, al-istighfar, means that there is a special emphasis that we should focus on concerning asking Allah to forgive our parents. Kulli ibn Adam khatta, we all have sins. They cannot now ask for forgiveness for themselves because they have passed away. However, as a righteous son or a righteous daughter, we can ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive them. So if one's parents have passed away, one of them or both of them, even if they're alive, that you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive them and to protect them from any evil or sins that they committed in their, in their lives. The third that is mentioned is in further ahdihima. And that is to fulfill any agreements or pledges that they made while they, they were alive. They made a promise to somebody, a pledge, an agreement, but then they passed away, they were unable to fulfill that. You are now made aware of that, you should try to fulfill that. You should try to fulfill that pledge that they agreed before they passed away. And fourthly, is being respectful to their friends and maintaining all such ties of kinship, kinship which you have inherited through them. This goes to show that in Islam, when we are keeping up the ties of kinship and bonding a community, bonding families, it is not necessarily just the person that you know in front of you. But that person whom you know, that they will have an attachment to other people, that they love other people. And just as your parents, that they loved other people, you will love the people that they loved. Okay? You will love the people that your parents loved and cared for as well. So just as that they would keep ties between certain people, if they passed away, your parents, and they had close friends, to show goodness to your parents, that you will, subhanAllah, uphold a link between those people that they had a relationship with. So maybe you will give them gifts. Maybe that you will visit them. And we'll, there's a couple of examples that I mentioned now in, in, in the next uh, few hadith if we, if we reach them. And then the next hadith, again by Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, that the dead person uh, sorry, the, the hadith I just mentioned there, hadith number 35, is, is a weak hadith. Isnaduhu Dharif. Because of an individual called Ali ibn Ubayd al Sa'adi, la yu'raf. There's a, an individual in the chain that he's not known. Now. Certain aspects of the meaning of the hadith know that are, are sahih or authentic, which you can find making dua for one's parents in other authentic hadith. Okay, so it's not just to do away with the nation completely. But on its own, as we've uh, mentioned before, the hadith on its own, because of the chain, has an issue. But certain parts in terms of the meaning of the hadith, that they will be supported elsewhere. So hadith number 36, and again, is narrated by Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu. This has a sound chain. That the dead person would be upgraded after his death. So the person may have a certain daraja, a certain level with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then in the hereafter, 
that they will be raised and that they will question why that they have been raised at Darajat because they will be aware of what they put forth to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they will know what they did and they will know what they didn't do and then they will find themselves on a level which is greater than that they thought that they were deserving of so they will question my lord how can this be and he would be told your child ask for forgiveness for you okay so when you passed away your righteous son or your righteous daughter they asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive that deceased so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave that deceased of a number of sins which allowed them to be raised which allowed them to be raised so this is one of the greatest acts of help and dutifulness that we can do for our parents if they pass away is ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive them because this may enable them to reach a higher level, a higher degree in the hereafter. The next hadith, hadith number 37, Muhammad ibn Sirin, rahimahullah, said, We were with Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu one night and he said, O oh Allah, forgive Abu Hurairah and his mother and whoever asks for forgiveness for both of them. Muhammad ibn Sirin rahimahullah said we ask forgiveness for them so that we may be included in the supplication of Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu So you have from the great tabi'een, from the great students of the Sahaba Muhammad ibn Sirin sitting with Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu and Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu he made a dua that could be heard Oh Allah forgive Abu Hurairah is himself and forgive his mother Forgive. So he made dua for himself and his mother and whoever asks for forgiveness for both of them. So Allahumma ghfir li Abi Huraira wa Allahumma ghfir ummi Abi Huraira. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive Abu Huraira and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive the mother of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhuma. Muhammad ibn Sirin rahimahullah ta'ala he said upon hearing this we ask forgiveness for them. So he did that. He said, Oh Allah, forgive Abu Huraira and forgive the mother of Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhuma, so that we may be included in the supplication of Abu Huraira. So the dua of Abu Huraira was something which Muhammad ibn Sirin, rahimahullah, saw as something as, inshallah ta'ala, an answerable, answerable by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because I'm sure that it, was, it may be the case that he was aware that, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made special dua. Wallahu I don't know if he knew that. Maybe it is the case that he was aware that the Prophet Sallallahu made special dua for Abu Huraira and his mother. So Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu was a special individual. So Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu making dua, people wanted to come under the dua of Abu Huraira. Just as people, when the Prophet ﷺ made dua for certain people, they felt honored and of course they were honored at the fact that the Prophet ﷺ made for them a special dua. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu made dua for himself, for his mother and anyone who makes, who asks, uh, asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us. So Muhammad ibn Sirin rahimahullah said we used to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they, he subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives them so that we may be included in the supplication of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. Remember that uh, the title of this chapter is uh, The Dutifulness Towards Parents After Their Death. So we would understand here that Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu is making a dua for his mother who had passed away. Okay, so that's, this is why this hadith is, has been mentioned here. So the next hadith is hadith number 38 again narrated by Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu he said that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said when a person dies all his actions come to an end with the exception of three things a sadaqatun jariyah which is a continuous charity a knowledge that benefits or a righteous child who makes a supplication for him or her now this hadith is um, a hadith that can be used 
to give us an understanding as to what are we permitted or what we as children, sons or daughters, what can I do for my parents if they pass away? Can I do this in their name? Can I do that in their name? What am I allowed to do for my parents once they pass away? Can I pray for them or can I actually offer salah? I'm going to pray salah. I'm going to offer 10 raka'at and I offer those raka'at to my parents. Is that allowed for me or not? Okay, I want to recite the whole Qur'an and dedicate the whole Qur'an, the recitation for my parents. I want to fast 10 days. Um, and those fasts, can I just dedicate them to my parents? What, what do we do here? Is this from al well, It's a good intention. It's a good intention because I want to dedicate, I want to offer some help uh, or something that will benefit my parents in their grave and ultimately in the hereafter. Now this hadith can be used to say that that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said إِذَا مَاتَ الْعَبْدُ إِنْ قَطْعَ عَنْهُ عَمَدُ That when a person, when they die, their deeds come to an end. That's it. It's clear. إِنْ قَطْعَ means hey, that's it. So you can't do it anymore. You can't come back and pray. You can't come and fast. You can't, back, can't come back and make tasbih or anything like that. إِنْ قَطْعَ عَنْهُ عَمَدُهُ It comes to an end. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made an exception. Illa min thalaf, except that there are three things. And the first thing is that if a person in their life, that they set up a school, okay, a madrasa, where people are learning uh, the Quran, for example, or if they passed away and a madrasa was set up in the name of Fulan or Fulan, so and so, <coughs> this would be a continuous charity for them. So even though that person passed away, <coughs> Somebody by themselves or somebody dedicated that to be a continuous charity for them. Somebody dug a well, okay, in the name of so-and-so. That can be a continuous charity for that person. So whenever people that they benefit drink the water from that well, whenever they benefit from that madrasa or the building of a masjid, for example, even, okay, the person will get a reward for that, continuous. <coughs> as long as that people are taking benefit from that school, that masjid, okay, or that well. The second one that is mentioned is A knowledge that people will benefit from So you wrote a book You gave a lesson You gave some form of knowledge that people That they will benefit in the future After you After you pass away And thirdly Or a pious child Who will make dua for them now this doesn't mean it is strictly a male, it could be a male or female. Male or female, that they are righteous, making a dua for them. Okay, so the origin is that when a person dies, that their deeds are over. However, there are some exceptions, and this hadith mentions three. Okay, a continuous charity, a knowledge that people may benefit from, and a righteous child making dua for them. We find in other hadith that there are other exceptions as well that is permitted for you to perform a hajj or an umrah on behalf of the deceased okay, upon the condition that you have done the umrah or the hajj uh, for yourself okay if that person also had who, who, decide, who, who deceased who passed away had made another made like a, a vow to fast some days okay and they hadn't fulfilled that some of the scholars have the opinion, it's based on the generations, to say that you can fast those days on behalf of that individual if they had made a vow. It's called another in Arabic. What is that? If you've never heard that, it's like making like a promise to do something in terms of worship if something happens. Okay, if I pass my exams, I'll give 50 pounds in charity. Okay, or if something happens, if I, you know, if I get better, okay, um, I will fast, you know, three days. This is called a vow. Okay, making a vow is disliked, by the way, okay, it's disliked because you're obligating something upon yourself, something that Allah subhanahu wa did not obligate for you. However, if you do fulfill that vow, you are rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, you are rewarded by Allah jalla wa'ala for, full, uh, for fulfilling uh, that vow. So if a person had uh, some days that they wanted to make uh, their part of a vow and they hadn't done that, it is permitted for one of the aqarib, one of the uh, close relations, to make up those fasts uh, for that individual. Now, those who take the approach that it is only allowed to dedicate acts of ibadah to the deceased based upon nusus, based upon texts, 
then they will restrict it to these few that I've mentioned. So things like dedicating prayers, okay, or dedicating Qira'at al-Qur'an, the recitation of the Qur'an, is something that we have no basis for, therefore it's not correct to do, because there's no proof for it. Okay, so there is those scholars who say that we will only stick to what we find in the texts, that what you can benefit the deceased with. And that seems to be uh, the stronger opinion. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. The next hadith, uh, hadith is the hadith of Ibn Abbas, hadith number 39. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma said, A man said, the messen O Messenger of Allah, my mother died without a will. Will it help her if I give sadaqah on her behalf? He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, yes. So, we mentioned uh, in the previous class that it is allowed for a person to make a wasiyya, to bequeath an amount to certain individuals who will not directly inherit from you. Okay, you can direct some of your wealth, which is the hadith of Abu Sa'id al Khudri, radiallahu anhu. We made this hadith just last week, actually. That he was very close to death and he asked the Prophet, وسلم, can I dedicate half of my wealth? The Prophet ﷺ said no. And then he went to a third, and then the Prophet ﷺ said, وَثُلُثُ كَثِيرٌ You could do a third of your wealth, but even a third is a lot. Okay? So if a person hadn't uh, written a will, and then uh, the son or the daughter uh, wanted to give some sadaq on her behalf, would it help her? The Prophet ﷺ said, no, nah, it would. Again, this shows how uh, the children, that they can help their parents uh, once they pass away. Okay, we'll take one more chapter, inshallah, which has two narrations. Okay, I have a question on the hmm? Yeah. Um, on the hadith that Muhammad bin Salim, yeah. Allah, he made he heard he met Abu Hurairah no. and he heard him say the dua. No. So that's why he was making that dua. Yeah. Does that mean we can make dua for Abu Hurairah as well? Or, or? Yeah, we make dua for Abu Hurairah now. So that we okay. come and do it as well, inshallah. The fact that Muhammad bin Salim, Allah, made dua for Abu Hurairah, we likewise, inshallah, we make dua for Abu Hurairah, so that we come and do the hadith as well. Yeah, no. Okay, we'll take So chapter number 20, which is uh, titled Charitable, Charitable Acts Towards Whom One's Father Was Charitable. Okay? It will become clear, inshallah, the meaning of this. So, Ab Abdullah ibn Dinar said, Abdullah ibn Umar, radiallahu anhuma, passed by a Bedouin man during a journey. In other narrations, it says that Abdullah ibn Umar was on his way to Mecca. The Bedouin's father had been a friend of Umar radiallahu anhu. So he, Ibn Umar, asked the Bedouin, are you not the son of so-and-so? And he replied, yes. So Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu ordered that he be given a donkey, which he would take on along in his journey. He also took up his turban and gave it to the man. One of those with Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu said, wouldn't two dirhams be enough for him? Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu replied, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, maintain what your father loved. Do not sever it, otherwise Allah would put out your light. Okay, now the story is authentic. Okay, this story is authentic and it is found in Sahih Muslim. However, the last wording where it is said what the Prophet sallallahu said, that is da'if. Okay, now uh, Imam al-Bukhari took this and narrated it from his, his shaykh, from his teacher. And it is said that his teacher kind of mixed up two different narrations. And it become clear what is said in the next narration. And because it is a very short narration, uh, we'll mention that as well and we'll explain the story as well. 
So again, in hadith number 41, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, the best form of dutifulness is that one maintains relationships or relations with the people one's father loved. Okay, so the ma'ana, the meaning of it is is authentic. And this second hadith here, in number 41, is, is authentic. So we'll explain the story. So Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu is making his way to Mecca. And he comes across a Bedouin man. Abdullah ibn Umar recognizes this Bedouin man. And he said that your father was a friend of my father. Your father was a friend of my father. Of course, he made sure that you are so and so and your father is so and so. And after getting those answers, yes, my father is so and so. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu was aware that right, this individual is very close to my father. What did Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu do? Anhuma, what did he do? He gave him two things. He said, I have a donkey. Now at that time, what they would do is that they would usually travel by camel. But they would take along with them also a donkey. What was the purpose of the donkey? That when they would be traveling on the camel, at times to give it a rest, because if you're sitting on it all the time, you'll tire it. There are times when you need to just lay walk without carrying any load. So they would get off the camel and that they would ride on the donkey for a while. They would ride on the donkey for a while, so to give raha, so to give some rest to the camel. What Abdullah ibn Umar said, this donkey you take, it's yours. And he also took off his turban and gave it as a gift to the man. He gave this, or these two gifts, to this individual. Why? Because his father was somebody who was not only close, but had a strong relationship with Umar radiallahu anhu. Which goes back to, because he remembered and, he, and is mentioned in the next uh, statement, that the best form of dutifulness is to maintain relations with the people one's father loved. So Umar radiallahu anhu had an affection, had loved the father of this, the Bedouin man, who was the son. But yet still, um, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu saw this as a relationship, as a link. So he will uphold that. The people who were around him were surprised that was, wouldn't one or two dinars or dirhams be enough to give to that person? Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu replied to them that the best form of, of upholding ties of dutifulness to one's parents is to those people whom your, your father loved, that you show goodness to them as well. Another point is that how would it be the case, or how would Ibn Umar know this, this individual and know the father? Clearly, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu would bring his son, Abdullah ibn Umar, to visit and to be with people that he had a relationship with. Wouldn't just leave him at home. Okay, this shows the importance of if you have a son, that you take him out with you and let him see and experience life with you once they become of age. So Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu came across and saw many people. He would see the people that his father had a relationship with, which goes the importance of nurturing children in the correct way. Now, so the, the, the last part of that hadith, the statement, which is in hadith number 40, is in fact da'if, but the, what is mentioned there in, in uh, hadith number 41, is authentic. And here we'll stop in Shadow Tara. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa baraka alayhi wa muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Okay. Subhanallah, 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 alhamdulillah. Subhanallah, 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 alhamdulillah. Subhanallah, subhanallah.